Welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage, day two of the Linux Foundation's Open Source Summit 2023. This is theCUBE, I'm your host, John Furrier, Rob Streche. He and I are breaking down the analysis here. We're bringing all the best guests in. Got a great guest, Gabriel Columbro, general manager of the Linux Foundation in Europe, as well as the executive director who runs FinOS, FinTech Open Source Foundation. Gabriel, great to see you, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me here, folks. So we were just talking about the, um, the FinTech, how AI is going to change that. Obviously open source has, has moves the needle, raised the bar big time on, on FinTech. Yeah. Um, and the Linux Foundation Europe, I don't know where to go. I think Linux Foundation Europe, probably easy thing to say, give a quick overview of what's going on there and then let's jump into FinOS. Perfect, yeah, so. We launched Linux Foundation Europe in September last year. It's been a couple of years in the making, and of course, you know, uh, the Linux Foundation has a pretty strong presence in Europe anyway. You know, about a third of our members is in Europe. We have several sort of, I would call them, Europe strong projects like Finos, for example, or LF Energy, or, you know, OS Climate. Uh, but the reality is that we, we really saw the need for providing a local entity that would, you know, enable regional level collaboration, but without fostering you know, fragmentation or, or geopolitic sort of balkanization of technology that we're seeing you know, more and more growing. And so um, it's been a pretty fun ride, I have to say, running a Linux Foundation Europe out of California. It's, uh, <laughs> it's an early start. It's a time zone uh, challenge, of uh, course. But yeah, you know, as, you, as you can hear, I'm from that Italian part of yeah. California, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I was born and bred in Italy and it is also, from a personal perspective, something yeah. really interesting to really being able to up-level uh, yeah. what's happening in And bringing in the infrastructure. Source. The Linux Foundation has matured so greatly and uh, watching it grow from the beginning. I'd Absolutely. say that you, this event here, again, is a great testimony. It's not the 10,000 or plus 30,000 people you see at KubeCon or CNCF. It's the right people. Yes. It's the brain trust. It's the, it's the right actors and, and all the different projects coming together. It's yep. going to set the agenda for open source. In Europe, the Cube is going global. We're going to have a presence uh, in London and in, in Europe. We're going to create sub-cubes or subnets of Cube in our network. So look for the Cube, we'll be working with you. And I think that for developers, I think having the Linux Foundation there is going to be a great asset because the support yep. that you guys provide projects, just take a minute to explain how important that is because you guys can make or break a project with the right support, because why would they want to go get venture funding? Yep. There's some, sometimes, even today on stage we heard that, you know, like Jim Zemlin said, would you take venture funding or go self-funding? Self and yeah. she said, we'll go self-funding. Yeah. Right. But this is really the dynamics. Take a minute to explain that. I, I, look, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the Linux Foundation has a global platform, and I wouldn't go as far as saying that we can make or break projects. <laughs> Ultimately, it's our contributors <laughs> and it's our yeah. uh, uh, you know members that yeah. that through their investments uh, can make a project successful. But absolutely, the platform that we produce and we provide, sorry, to our projects. Um, I'm really excited to see that apply to European level collaboration. It's a yeah. very different landscape. Yeah. Uh, the more I, the more time I spend there, the more I realize, you know. Uh, the need for a stronger engagement of the public sector, for example. And I think the Linux Foundation over the years has done a massive, fantastic job to really yeah. marry the needs of individual developers and the private sector. I think as we go to Europe, the, the providing an open governance where the public sector can actually have a strong, not only funding role, but really driving role in these projects is going to be And important. the growth is amazing. We, had, we saw 10,000 people at KubeCon EU. It was, Amsterdam was 2,000 on the waiting list, was packed. Yep. That's a tell sign. We also checked in on a lot of the sovereign cloud discussions. Massive growth in countries. Yes. Uh, on the cloud growth side, even yes. in the US, they're cost optimizing a little bit. In certainly Europe, there's a lot of growth there, big time. Yeah, and I, I think that was, that was my, my, I guess, question mark was, how much of it is the consumers that are actually then participating back in in Europe yep. versus how much is it really the governmentals that are, are really contributing? It's a really good question. I would say ultimately, you know, in Europe there is there's no such thing as big tech yeah. as much as, you know, of course in the US and in the West Coast specifically. So ultimately, you're right. On one hand, there is a strong grassroots uh, open source engagement. I, you know, I come from that world. I grew up in the Apache Software Foundation. I had dreadlocks when I was a kid, you know, kind of from that really individual driven aspect of, right. of contributing to open source. Um, but Certainly the public sector has a stronger yeah. role to play, I think, in, yeah. in, in Europe. Just 
you know, for the very dynamic of the market. And you're seeing regulations coming down, uh, many of which are going to shape technology. You know, if you think about GDPR, yeah, it right. really set the, the golden standard for data privacy, which is now, you know, yeah. be, you sort of, copied in California, right, CCPA, CCPA. And, and across the world. So certainly I think the public sector has a stronger role to play than maybe in other uh, regions of the world. But the other angle is, as much as there's no big tech, there are very strong very vertical growth. industrial yeah, it's, it's industries that are going through the digital transformation. And again, this yeah. kind of, you know, my experience with Finos probably biases me a little on, on the, the, the <laughs> potential no, we agree. We're seeing of it. a we're vertical seeing it. We're seeing it out foundation. There. I mean, we're seeing it out there in Europe, definitely awesome. We're looking forward to working with you out there in Europe, looking forward to it. But the exciting thing you did, the, the FinTech Open Source Foundation, really incredible job, congratulations. Thank you. It's been a smashing success. Not, you know, it's been a tailwind. FinTech always throws money at new stuff. Yes. Cloud, servers, yes. high frequency trading. Now with cloud and AI, AI and data and open source, yes. the needle moved a lot. Can you take us through what's going on with FinOS? Um, what's the update? How many projects? What's the, what's the, um, yeah. the stats? Yeah, I'll give you I'll give you a little bit of the of the background, and then I'll tell you what happening what's happening right now. Actually, today let me start from today. We announced Fidelity Investments joining Finos today, mm. which is a major milestone for us. Um, so look, Finos started about six years ago. We were an independent foundation, uh, basically funded by the largest investment banks in the world. They really realized that from a talent perspective, from a digital transformation perspective, and really from an efficiency perspective. You know, the margins are nowhere nearly where they were, you know, before 2008. Um, open source could be a pillar of, of digital transformation, very much like cloud. And so that's where we started uh, over the last six years, you know. I'm not going to say that it's always been easy. You know, actually, I, I <laughs> am, easy. I'm, I'm 21 and I age a lot. <laughs> no, okay, we're 25, right? But, but, uh, yeah. but uh, um, you know, this is an industry that's been very historically conservative, risk averse, and so it took a lot of, and we continue to do a lot of education into how they can uh, really improve their business, be more efficient, be yeah. more innovative through open source, share some of this R&D that they definitely invest a lot on. Um, we joined the Linux Foundation in 2020, and since then we've experienced massive growth. I mean, 2022, we had the largest sort of growth in terms of membership. We had the logos like Discover, uh, Amex, Google. Yeah. This year we had Fidelity joining us. And what we're seeing really is open source starting to really take over the whole value chain of financial services. It started with investment banks, it's now moving to the buy side, the large asset managers and, and, and uh, you know, the, the likes of Fidelity, the likes of Wellington, uh, the likes of BlackRock, who's a, who's a great yeah. uh, a member of the Linux Foundation. Uh, we are now seeing the retail and commercial side of the house uh, yeah. starting to, to really well, embrace, yeah, we, like Discover, for we, example. We reported heavily on the Silicon Valley Bank and the yes. First Republic failure, mainly yes. Silicon Valley Bank, that that could have been avoided with good AI. So, yes. you know, you we're at a level now where Rob and I were talking yesterday in the open that open source and AI are going to have a collision course yes. and someone better be ready. So, so open source is ready. FinTech is most impacted by this because one, high frequency trading, has done check done that physics. Yep. Now the data insights. Yes. I mean, if you look at Silicon Valley Bank, it was literally an oversight. Yes. That domino effect was a data opportunity yes. that could have been solved with good fintech, good good code, good observability, good data. And I would Missed. argue, look, one of our three strategic initiatives is called Open RegTech, open source regulation. We think that there's a lot of potential for all the parties involved to really find the third way between regulation and deregulation. There's a way of making regulation very efficient. And to your point, you know, uh, it only so happened that Silicon Valley was a, Silicon Valley Bank was a little under the threshold of you know stress tests and sort of those Dodd Frank regulations that apply to the largest organizations. So to your point open source can really bring a much more sort of transparent collaboration, not only across the banks, as yeah. we're seeing right now, the fintechs and the vendors, the buy side, but really the regulators. And to be honest, I'm not going to say that this is going to be easy. You no, know, well, this I think is what, very well, the thing that you're onto that I think is super important, which is why I, th I love your project is, and your, t and your organization is, banking is a system. Yes. If something gets broken, it, it affects other things. Yes. If you look at Silicon Valley Bank, and if you look down at that as like a patient, yep. That actually had repercussions because they're all working together. Yep. JP Morgan, yep. 
all the banks, yes. so one node gets pulled out in the system. Prior to the regulation, they were all kind of bespoke, but they're all connected. Very much. And they so. have to keep yeah. things in the family. That's why that whole, you know. It's very well but, said because you know, this is one of the ways I, I pitch to my board members who are pretty senior folks in, in the organizations, uh, in some of the, again, tier one, tier two banks. Um, look, it took a long time for big tech to understand that open source was a great way for them to, to advance technology, commoditize competitors, you know, create new markets. And this organization really have no sort of reason, innate reasons to collaborate with each other. As you say, the financial system is completely connected. They could not do business unless they transact with each other. And so things like interoperability, uh, mutualizing common requirements like regulation, it makes a whole lot of sense as long as you're able, of course, to yeah. slot in those quick wins that then yeah. allow these sort of senior execs to understand, okay, well, I shouldn't be feeding open source. And to be honest, I was very pleased to see that after Lock for Shell last year, you know, which could yeah. have certainly signaled a strong slowdown in, in the open source, you know, in the fear that these organizations have uh, uh, of open source potentially. Uh, and even this year with the SVB and the complex economic climate, I'm actually seeing firms doubling down on open source, really showing how counter-cyclical open source is, like when there is more pressure, people do double down on open source. Yeah, and I think, do you think this is more symptomatic about how their digital transformation journey is going and where they're at in that? I think it's absolutely, I think, I wouldn't say that there is a full understanding just yet that open source in my mind is as critical as cloud in the process of, of digital transformation. But certainly if you analyze which are the components that are needed for a successful digital transformation, you know, innovative technology, uh, talent, yeah. and uh, uh, you know, even just a, a, a better organizational no, structure I mean, I would, that reflects. I would, say, I would say it's just important, and I'll tell you why. Maybe Please. scope wise. It's not, might not be, but open source is, depend, is interconnected to, to cloud. Yes. Everyone will have open source in their cloud, yep. period. Yep. Whether it's a Red Hat or their own project or something. So, yep. so it's dependent upon each other. Absolutely, you know, so. and especially as it becomes more of a platform. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, uh, you know, platform plays. I mean, that's my, my sort of All right, let's talk about platform. There we go, here we go. I was going to say, but, right but the reality is the more Thank you. the let's banks go. become platforms yeah. and you know, host applications for fintechs or for their customers, <laughs> you know, platform and open source go hand in hand yeah. because you, you're not delivering sort of the last mile solution is a perfect you know, fit. The platform is built in the open and then, yeah. you know, everyone has a clear yeah. demarcation line to go build solutions that they can monetize and hopefully reinvest in the ecosystem. So yeah. it makes a whole lot of sense. They just, I think, are starting to understand how this can yeah. play in financial services. I, I think that's the really interesting thing we had Fidelity on yesterday yeah. after their uh, contribution to us. Uh, Jenkins plugin. Yeah, the Jenkins, Jenkins plugin yep. for events. And so, the big thing is platform engineering is yes. really all the rage. And yes. I, I think it's, as we've been talking about for you know, quite a while now, it's, it's really the new IT. Right? Yes. It's how do you upskill people. Yep. It, do you see that really taking hold within your organization as well? Well, I, I have to say that Finos certainly brought a lot of uh, visibility of financial services into the broader open source community. Mm -hmm. But the flip side is that we're starting to see actually these organizations invest in upstream. So Fidelity is a great example. They mm -hmm. just joined Finos, but they've been a member of OpenSSF, right. a member of CNCF for the longest time. Uh, we're starting to see organizations like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Citi being leaders, for example, in OpenSSF, the Open Source Security Foundation, in the realization that, yeah, everyone has a role to play in ensuring sustainability of yeah. the open source community. And I think to your specific question, there has been a really strong realization over the last 10 years that you cannot continue investing on your internal proprietary platform. I mean, many of these organizations have yeah. their own Java virtual machine, their own yeah. Linux distribution, their own programming language. Yeah. How on hell you're going to compete with an open ecosystem of talent that is based on yeah. Kubernetes, on open source projects. And so I think 
the, the critical part that I think is going to you know, make or break the digital transformation of this organization is that they really buy into open source and can tap into yeah. this broad talent because otherwise there is really a generational uh, gap What's there. your take on platform engineering versus say an app? So Fidelity has like 4,000 apps, yeah. resilience of apps. That's the makeup of a company. But these apps are also using open source which have ecosystems that, that look like a platform but they're yes. apps. Yes. They, but they have APIs, they connect to other things. Yes. So platform engineering has to look a lot like a centralized organization. That's an IT definition in my opinion. That's just me personally. It's yeah. central, a centralized organization to handle all the rules. <coughs> IT. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's platform, that's going to be security. Now, when you're in open source, you have dependencies. It's not like, yes. I have my project, yes. I'm going to load my Ubuntu, done. Oh, now everything's connected, so your customers are now connected to a bunch of other stuff. Yep. How do you talk about platform engineering in context to apps that might have dependencies to other projects? What's it's, your, it's a complex question. It's a but, really complex question. Your, I would say there are, a couple of, there are a couple of, uh, of angles there. I think the primary angle is, um, look, there is no way that these folks can manage everything centrally in the new world, to be honest. It is going to be a combination of platform and apps that have to be more open, have to be more, you know, again, at least an open ecosystem of apps. When it comes to s the central sort of role of IT or platform engineering, I think policies are going to be the ones that have to be centralized. You're not going to move away out of the compliance department uh, or, or risk department wanting to impose their interpretation over certain regulations. So things like, for example, you know, you've heard over the last few years, many attempts to create the financial cloud or, or a regulated cloud. You know, there's been a big IBM uh, uh, Bank yeah. of America announcement a couple of years ago. Uh, we think actually that open source and open standards can really become uh, sort of the way that all these organizations agree on common patterns and how it means, what it means to actually run uh, financial workloads in cloud. But then of course, you know, they will have to act in a sort of distributed way within those organizations. I mean, one of the major pro standards that we have in Finos is called FDC3, and it's really about financial desktop collaboration connectivity consortium. So it's really about that application interoperability you were talking about. Um, I think we are going to see basically a more centralized IT department that still manages uh, the platform, yeah. but Policies. you're going to see v policy, right. yes. Policy-based stuff, here's your guardrails for developers. Absolutely, including how you engage in open source. I mean, big part of what we do is helping them understand how you provision a developer to actually be able to work in open source, because until three years ago, they had to go home, yeah. use their laptop, doing it from their own garage, yeah. even though they were contributing to something that their company were using. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 I, I think, and I think one of the big things that, are you seeing those people in that organization, given that they're starting to get more involved in the open source yep. and they're modernizing, some are behind others in that space and adopting cloud. Are they going and pushing on those cloud vendors to actually get involved? And do you see that not only from the horizontal, you know, hyperscale yep. types, but do you see that more regionally, like you know, the OVHs or the Orange or KPNs and the yeah. world. Uh, yes, I would say there's still a major focus on the hyperscalers. Primarily, yeah. that's been sort of my my experience. You know, Google is a member. Yeah. We are now we have a project called Compliant Financial Infrastructure that is really now contributed by contributed to by a bunch of of uh, not only banks but you know hyperscalers as well. Red Hat clearly plays an important role in there. I have seen again. This is more through my for LF Europe hat. I certainly think in Europe there is a different dynamic where they are yeah. really trying, you know, from the standpoint of digital sovereignty, uh, to really invest more on, you know, the open nebulas of the world or, or the sort of regional players. Uh, but I do think that, kind of going back to that regulation uh, that is coming down from right. Europe, you know, the hyperscalers, you know, Europe is too big of a market yeah. for not uh, sort of collaborating and complying with some of these regulations. And so, you know, I want to see certainly a more, you know, open source is about creating right. open ecosystem and a more varied, uh, yeah. you know, set of, of, of vendors. Um, well, but I, to I, be honest, the focus in Finos has been primarily with the hyperscalers. Yeah. Most of the large organizations that are global, they tend to work I, with I, hyperscalers. I, I find it super interesting that it's Google 
yes. leading the way with you because they're, they're one of their products, yes. GA, the, yep. uh, is uh, Google Analytics, yes. is outlawed in five European countries. Yes. So how, how, how do you, and for lack of a better way, how do you grok that? Like, like understand what's going on between what they're doing on one side of the fence, yet with one of their applications, and how they, how does that really work out? Well, I think I would, I would counter to you that that is probably exactly the reason why Google is the one that is already in Finos, because they're trying to make grounds back in sort of understanding exactly what the needs are uh, of their customers. Now, that's from the Finos side. Yeah. I think from the LF Europe side, and really sort of what's, what's the landscape in Europe, um, you know, I'll tell you even more. Most of my banks can't use Google Drive or Google Docs. You know, like a standard way of collaborating in open source communities has become a major friction for us. And so I think that's, that's certainly one of the reasons why they're in Finos. I think in terms of, of Europe, um, look, uh, it, it's always the, the known market leader that really tries in my mind to invest in open source to you know yeah. make up grounds. I mean anchor, we've seen the anchor, example anchor brand. of yes. Kubernetes yes. itself, you know, yes. that's that's really the very reason why it was contributed originally. Who are the anchor brands then in your in your area? In uh, in Finos, Finos it's yeah. primarily look the the platinum Google. members are the are the Bank. actually no that, that's that's the beauty of a vertical foundation. We start from the end users. The platinum members are Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Deutsche Bank, Citi, all the largest global tier one banks. And then we have, of course, uh, Societe Generale, uh, AXA. We're starting to really move into more European uh, mm -hmm. uh, organizations. And what we're seeing now with Fidelity being you know, the announcement of the day, we're starting to see uh, open source follow the value chain, follow the money chain. So we started from investment bank, sell side. We're now seeing the buy side uh, and, and asset manager coming in. We're starting to see payment processors like uh, uh, Discover and American Express being part of the game. And of course, all the vendors, to your point, that want to better understand this market and use open source to engage both at developer level, developer mindshare, and of course in our board we have pretty pretty senior C levels. Gabriel, great to have you on the queue. We got we got to run. Time's tight. You know I can we're, talk. We're, <laughs> you're definitely going to come back. <laughs> uh, there's so much more to unpack. But a real quick final question for you is, you guys nailed the vertical yeah. foundation. I think that's a huge accomplishment. Yes. And, and props to you. I think it's Thank one of the you. first I've seen that's been like right on point because that's you're backing in from the customer. It's there's, very there's exactly. incentives are there. Absolutely. It's a real robust. Man, market. almost like. You read my material. Uh, yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're pretty sharp on the view. <laughs> pay, pay attention, you know, we're good. Um, but I got to ask you, is it a thing? Do you think you're going to see more of these? Because, you know, we're a media vertical. We can literally open source the queue. But Absolutely. Like, like other vertic vertical clouds have been attempted. We call them super clouds. I think you'll see the leaders, the end users, what we saw with hyperscalers, and you're seeing Amazon enable like Snowflake. Snowflake doesn't have a cloud. Yep. They're on top of a hyperscaler. Yep. So, what you're doing might be a super project, yes. super foundation, because you're essentially enabling a vertical solution. Yes. Do you think vertical um, foundations might be a thing? I think so, and of course I'm biased, having been, no, but you but know, is FinTech having a unicorn in the sense that it's a robust market, or do you see this replicating into well, other verticals, like I healthcare think, would be I one I think that. we should yeah. see, and this is where I think my, I, I, I thought I was running LF Europe just because of my thick Italian accent, <laughs> but the reality <laughs> is that I see a lot of the experience that I had in Finos being very applicable to the European market, where there's not as much big tech, and so as, different industries undergo digital transformation, they all are going to have to be sort of buying yeah. into open source. And I think you nailed it. We don't start from the technology. We start from the business problem of a certain customer, of a certain industry. So in a way, much more of a sort of product yeah. type approach. Yeah. And so, yes, healthcare, you know, we have LF Public Healthcare, <laughs> which started during COVID, but I think has a lot more potential with the caveats of yeah. being a probably even more conservative and regulated industry, LF Energy is yeah. strong in Europe. So I think yeah. at the crossroads of my experience of Finos and sort of the, the strategic drivers of yeah. development in Europe, vertical industries is going to be yeah. a thing. Well, well, we're definitely going to pick this up. We'll follow up on theCUBE, we'll get back from back at the ranch, we'll do it. 
The Cube here following the bouncing ball on open source. A lot of things happening. We're keeping track of it. We're calling balls and strikes. We're here. <laughs> I'm John Furrier, Rob Strecce. Gabriel, thank you for coming up. Head thank of the you. Europe, uh, Europe Linux Foundation as well as the successful Finos, uh, FinTech. Uh, open Source Foundation, uh, great success story. Thanks for coming on. Thank you All so right, much. All right, we'll be for back more here. after lunch, day two, Cube, wall to wall coverage after the short break. Stay with us, we'll be right back. <laughs>